আমার প্রিয় শিক্ষার্থীবৃন্দ সহকর্মীবৃন্দ এবং যে সকল দর্শক এই মুহূর্তে ফেসবুক পেজ এবং ইউটিউব চ্যানেলের মাধ্যমে আমাদের এই প্রোগ্রামটি দেখছেন আপনাদের সকলকে আমাদের বিভাগের আয়োজিত আজকের যে ইন্টারন্যাশনাল ফিজিক্স ওয়েবিনার সেই ওয়েবিনারে স্বাগতম আশা করি সকলে ভালো আছেন এবং সুস্থ আছেন শুভ সন্ধ্যা সবাইকে এবং শুভ সকাল যারা ইউএসএ থেকে আমাদের প্রোগ্রামটা দেখছেন তাদের সকলকে আপনারা ইতিমধ্যে অবগত হয়েছেন যে আমরা গত জুন মাস থেকে আমাদের ছাত্রছাত্রীদেরকে পড়াশোনার মধ্যে ধরে রাখা এবং বিজ্ঞানের প্রতি আকর্ষণ তৈরি করার জন্য আমরা একটা উদ্যোগ গ্রহণ করেছিলাম সেই ধারাবাহিকতায় আজকে আমাদের একশো ছিয়াত্তরতম ইন্টারন্যাশনাল ফিজিক্স ওয়েবিনার এবং আমরা আজকে আমাদের সাথে স্পিকার হিসেবে পেয়েছি আমাদের শ্রদ্ধ স্যার ডক্টর মোহাম্মদ অনুল হুদা স্যারকে অ্যাসোসিয়েট প্রফেসর গ্র্যাজুয়েট অ্যাডভাইজার অফ ফিজিক্স ডিপার্টমেন্ট অফ ফিজিক্স দ্য ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ টেক্সাস আর্লিংটন আর্লিংটন ইউএসএ এবং স্যার ইতিমধ্যে আমাদের সাথে সংযুক্ত হয়েছেন স্যারকে আমি আমাদের ওয়েবিনারে স্বাগতম শুভ সন্ধ্যা এবং শুভ সকাল স্যার এবং অনলাইনের মাধ্যমে আপনাকে আমাদের ওয়েবিনারে স্বাগত ধন্যবাদ অনেক ধন্যবাদ স্যার এই ব্যস্ত সময়ের থেকেও আমাদেরকে সময় দিয়েছেন আমাদের ছাত্র ছাত্রীদের কথা চিন্তা করে তো যারা এই অনুষ্ঠানে নতুন দেখছেন তাদের উদ্দেশ্যে বলতে চাই যে আমরা আমাদের ওয়েবিনারটাকে তিনটা ভাগে ভাগ করার চেষ্টা করি প্রথমে আমরা চেষ্টা করি আমাদের স্পিকারকে আপনাদের সাথে পরিচয় করে দিতে তারপরে আমাদের স্পিকার তার বক্তব্য পেশ করবেন এবং শেষে আমরা একটা সময় রাখি কোশ্চেন অ্যান্ড অ্যান্সার সেশন বা ডিসকাশন হুম সে সময় যে কেউ চাইলে আমাদের সাথে সংযুক্ত হতে পারবেন এবং পাশাপাশি আপনারা ফেসবুক এবং ইউটিউবে কমেন্টের মাধ্যমেও আমাদের শ্রদ্ধ সাথে আপনারা আপনাদের প্রশ্নগুলো করতে পারবেন আজকে আমাদের যে ওয়েবিনার সেই ওয়েবিনারটা টাইটেলটা আপনারা হয়তো ইতিমধ্যে অবগত হয়েছেন তারপরেও আমরা দেখে নিই যে আজকে আমাদের ইন্টারন্যাশনাল ফিজিক্স ওয়েবিনার টাইটেলটা টাইটেল অপটিমাইজেশন অফ লাইট অ্যাবজর্ভিং ম্যাটেরিয়ালস এই কম্পিটিশনাল অ্যাপ্রোচ এবং আমাদের স্পিকার ডক্টর মোহাম্মদ নুরুল হুদা স্যার অ্যাসোসিয়েট প্রফেসর গ্র্যাজুয়েট অ্যাডভাইজার অফ ফিজিক্স ডিপার্টমেন্ট অফ ফিজিক্স দ্য ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ টেক্সাস অ্যাট আর্লিংটন ইউএসএ আমরা যদি স্যারের বায়োগ্রাফি দেখি ডক্টর মোহাম্মদ এম হুদা রিসিভ হিজ ট্রেনার অ্যাট ইউটিএ ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ টেক্সাস আর্লিংটন ইন টু থাউজেন্ড ফরটিন ইন ফিজিক্স ডিপার্টমেন্ট হিজ রিসার্চ ইন্টারেস্ট আর ইন থিওটিক্যাল অ্যান্ড কম্পিটিশনাল কন্ডেন্স মেটার ফিজিক্স উইথ অ্যান্ড ইন্টারেস্ট ইন স্ট্রংলি কোরিলেটেড এফ ইলেকট্রন সিস্টেম অ্যাজ ওয়েল অ্যাজ অ্যাপ্লিকেশন অফ মেটাল অক্সাইড টু সোলার এনার্জি কনভার্সন প্রসেস ফর রিনিউয়েবল অ্যান্ড সাস্টেনেবল এনার্জি বিফোর জয়নিং ইউটিএ ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ টেক্সাস আর্লিংটন হি ওয়াজ এ রিসার্চ অ্যাসোসিয়েট অ্যাট দ্য ন্যাশনাল রিনিউয়েবল এনার্জি ল্যাবরেটরি এন আর ইএল ডক্টর হুদা ইজ অ্যান এক্সপার্ট অন নিউ ম্যাটেরিয়ালস ডিসকোভারি ফর দ্য ডিজার্ভ অ্যাপ্লিকেশন অ্যান্ড দেয়ার ফেস স্টেবিলিটি প্রেডিকশন বাই কম্পিটিশনাল মডেলিং হি হ্যাজ নাইনটি পেপার পাবলিশড ইন রেফার্ড জার্নাল অ্যান্ড সেভারেল আদার পাবলিকেশন অ্যাজ বুক চ্যাপ্টার অ্যান্ড কনফারেন্স প্রসিডিং সো ফর হিজ এইস ইন্ডেক্স ইজ টোয়েন্টি সেভেন অ্যাকর্ডিং টু গুগল স্কলার হি হ্যাজ গিভেন অ্যাবাউট টোয়েন্টি ফাইভ ইনভাইটেড টক অ্যান্ড কলাকুয়েমস অ্যারাউন দ্য ইউএসএ অ্যান্ড অ্যাব্রড ডক্টর হুদা ইজ এ ফেলো অফ দ্য ক্যামব্রিজ কমনওয়েলথ ট্রাস্ট হি সার্ভ ইন অর্গানাইজিং কমিটিস অফ সেভারেল ন্যাশনাল অ্যান্ড ইন্টারন্যাশনাল কনফারেন্সেস অ্যান্ড মেম্বারশিপ এঙ্গেজমেন্ট কমিটি ইন ম্যাটেরিয়ালস রিসার্চ সোসাইটি হি ওয়াজ ওয়ান অফ দ্য ফান্ডিং কোয়ার্ডিনেটরস ফর দ্য গ্লোবাল ম্যাটেরিয়ালস নেটওয়ার্ক সো ফর হি হ্যাজ জেনারেটেড সিগনিফিকেন্স এক্সটার্নাল ফান্ডিং অ্যাট ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ টেক্সাস আর্লিংটন mainly for NSF and DOE subcontract. Uh, he completed his bachelor and master's degree uh, in physics uh, at the University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. His master's uh, in math degree was from the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics from Cambridge University, UK. Afterwards, he completed his PhD in physics from the University of Texas at Arlington. He was a postdoctoral fellow in physics and research associate at the University of Texas, Austin, and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So uh, we can see his um, uh, membership, Electrochemical Society, American Chemical Society, Material Research Society, American Physical Society Awards, the member sponsored by Sigma 11 uh, Honor Society, SCES Presentation Award, third place by my student, uh, his student, Eden Brain Glass, uh, ACS Best Poster Presentation Award by his student, Shafiq Moten, uh, paper selected for 
IOP selected, sponsored by Institute of Physics, and so on. So thanks. Shakalka Dhunabad, I'm Raku Namade, Sarakati Tulajabo. As I have a Gabor Shagatom, at the best of the Mudham, the Kishu, I do not know. No, 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 um, our uh, research basically theoretical and computational aspects of condensed matter physics. Um, I was trained on that subject um, in my PhD and afterwards. So uh, this what I will be presenting. The background picture of this slide, as you can see, this is basically the building where I have my office in Arlington. Um, uh, it's a uh, and the. The round shape, as you can see, this is a, the, one of the most advanced planetarium that we have in Texas. Um, my uh, first acknowledgement will go to the funding agencies that supported me in, in at least for the last 10, 15 years, uh, National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, and National Renewable, Renewable Energy Laboratory. The first thing that I will show before I go to some more acknowledgement is what I am going to do today. Um, so basically, the idea of this work or the work that I'm going to present is uh, based on solar energy conversion. Uh, why solar energy conversion? You will see it in a second. There are several devices, as you know, Jeguló uh, solar light ke electric power, othoba unno kono chemical fuel e transform korte pare. Um, one of the major things that we all know about is photovoltaic uh, cell, PV cell. Traditionally, PV cells are made with silicons, um, but the silicons are nowadays replaced by other material, um, which is, I think, um, some of you already know. Uh, so PV cell, what it can do? First, it absorbs light and then produce electricity. Now, produce electricity is good, but it definitely needs sunlight. So at night, this device cannot work. Uh, you can transform this ele electricity, or you can use this electricity or the photovoltaic to drive a, a photoelectrolysis cell. That means um, you can use that electricity to split water into oxygen and hydrogen. And this hydrogen then can be stored and be used as a fuel for getting energies. Um, let's say you can drive a car or if you store that hydrogen to burn the hydrogen and produce electricity at time when um, the PV cell cannot work due to lack of light. In other examples, for example, you know, it, this electrolysis cell can be used independently even. That is a photoelectrochemical cell. That is not a focus for today's talk. So I will not go into that. The important fact that why solar energy is so important is that the amount of solar energy that is strike Earth's surface every hour is more than enough to power the entire planet for a year. So we have plenty of solar energy that is coming to the, the surface of Earth. All we need to do is to utilize that energy convert it into an usable um, energy form, either electricity or some other chemical fuel like hydrogen, or there are some um, other method which I'm not discussing now. For example, converting carbon dioxide to some methane, which can be again used as a, as a fuel. So this solar energy carry a very important potential to be utilized properly. Now some uh, quick background before I go to the main presentation. As um, Dr. Das already mentioned that I was a student from Dhaka University. And this is the physics department in Dhaka University, we call it Karjan Hall. Um, and probably most of you already know that uh, we have a very um, important and I think one of the greatest discovery in modern physics was done in Karjan Hall in around 1924 when uh, uh, Sotten Bose, S. Bose, he derived uh, statistics for force-carrying particles, like for the bosons. 
the name boson came because of his work dr bose's work um, after he derived that mathematical formalism he sent to einstein to translate it in german and then it was published with both uh, Bose and Einstein's, both of their name. Hence, nowadays it's known as Bose Einstein statistics. So, if you, I think, if I think you know the importance of the work, all the fundamental particles in the universe can be divided into mostly two types. One are the bosons that carry forces, another type of particles are fermions, those are basically electrons, protons, uh, those have some half integer spins. So half of the particle in the universe is named after Schotten Bosch. When he did that work, he was a very young faculty at the physics department around 1920s. Um, then, of course, I went to Cambridge University, from Dhaka University, to do my master's in mathematical physics. I was fortunate that when I was a student, some of you probably know Stephen Hawking. He was a professor, so I get to see him at the time in my stay. Other historical figure in, in the same department, for example, in quantum mechanics, most of you know the name, uh, Paul Dirac, and of course, the, I, the great Isaac Newton. Uh, of course, Newton was there for, like, I think, more than 300 years ago now. Um, so th these are the greatest, some of, some of the greatest physicists who were in the same department. Um, so it has a rich history. Now, coming back to Bangladesh, now these are the few names that I really respect and honor. Um, the first two names, Professor Haruna Rashid, and second name, uh, Professor Lolita Mohannath. Uh, when I was a student in Dhaka University, these are the two persons uh, who inspired me, guided me, and personally took care of me um, for doing research in physics. Um, they are, I think, uh, they carry the glory of physics department in Dhaka University at the time. Um, and third person is Dr. Arun Kumar Boshak. Uh, I was a uh, lecturer at Rajshahi University for about two years. And uh, Professor Boshak, he basically guided me to show how to overcome the practical barriers for doing research at a professional level. Um, I have a huge respect for all of them. Um, and then third person who was not in a way my direct teacher or mentor, but I was fortunate to spend time with him, Dr. Jamal Nozrul Islam. Um, he was a very kind and person with whom you can get motivated by. Um, so this is another person I really want to give respect to build my career. Uh, whatever small thing I do now. Now, if this is my campus now. Uh, this is two pictures or photograph. One is about 130 years ago, one of the first building constructed at the Arlington campus. And the second one is the photograph of the student center. Uh, it's a uh, modern student center. Modern means it was built several, I think, 10, 15 years ago. This particular view of this, of this building. Um, and if we, if you want to see a bird's eye view, how the campus looks like, uh, in the campus at the University of Texas at Arlington, this is uh, a north northeast corner of the campus. So this is the northeast corner of the campus, uh, how it looks like. It ca you cannot see my building in this picture. It is hidden somewhere in here. And a building there, this this structure is uh, one of the largest football stadium in USA. Uh, it is called Cowboy Stadium. It is in Arlington, just 10 minutes from the campus. Now let's go back to the research. Um, I mean, as I mentioned already, that my research field is theoretical and computational condensed matter physics. What we do in this subject, especially in my group. We try to understand the physics of materials at the electronic level. And because we strive to understand the properties at the electronic level, hence quantum mechanical descriptions become indispensable. Now, what in details, for example, what we do? Um, 
we try to understand the fundamental interactions in the matter in the matter or materials um, and then the interactions of electrons photons phonons in the solid uh, that gives us everything we see around us but if you look around you your desk your computer your, everything is basically some form of interactions uh, between electrons photons and phonons because the light is scattered with this process we see things around us and this particular presentation is will deal with this fact not the scattering of light rather how the lights or the photons absorbed in the materials and also this also leads us as we try to strive this first two point to the applications um, we can discover new materials which we already did in my group um, our group is materials some computation a predictor asylum those were not existed in any database or in any lab before we predicted them and now most of them are already synthesized by some experimental group so we do that we discover new entirely new materials from first principle now the word first principle means that if you only know the atoms what kind of atoms that materials need and nothing else about the properties no experimental input from the information of the atoms uh, we should be able to uh, discover the materials and the, all the properties of the materials so that is we call the first principle and of course you know there are other exotic field if you search the condensed matter physics nowadays um, from application wise for example foldable electronics superconductors a very old subject some of the new topics like topological insulators or even quantum computers the computers uh, that we use now that you are probably using to see this talk those are something called um, von neumann computers linear computing um, algorithms not quantum algorithms the computers that can use quantum algorithm um, this requires a certain set of materials uh, we can also work from this understanding to discover those materials and lastly that i mostly work on to find replacement of fossil fuel these are the fuel that we burn like we burn petroleum or coal koni theke je koyla gulo ashe shegulo burn kori ba petroleum je gulo amra gari chalai othoba transformer e use hoy othoba natural gas এইগুলো বার্ন করার কারণে যে সমস্ত গ্রিন হাউস গ্যাস এমিট করে দেয়ার ইনক্রিজিং দ্য গ্লোবাল টেম্পারেচার হ্যান্স উই কল দ্য গ্লোবাল ওয়ার্মিং উই নিড টু রিভার্স ইট সো দিস ইজ ওয়ান অফ দ্য মাই পার্সোনাল ইন্টারেস্ট টু ওয়ার্ক অন দিস ফিল্ড অ্যান্ড টু ডু দিস থিং টু গেট এ মেটেরিয়ালস দ্যাট ক্যান দ্যাট ক্যান সার্ভ ফর দিস অ্যাপ্লিকেশন উই নিড টু আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড দ্য ফিজিক্স অফ দেম ফার্স্ট দিস ইজ হোয়াট উই উইল ডু আই উইল শো লিটল মোর অন দিস um let's move along so as i mentioned my main focus on renewable and sustainable energy i think you are familiar of this kind of scenario when we burn too much fossil fuel because of global warming we can reach at a point when the the temperature of the planet will be so high that it may turns out to be an unlivable man boshobasher ajoggo ekta planet hoye jete pare at some point in in future the way we are going right now burning all kind of fossil fuels um this may not be too far in fact uh, united nations document says that we already uh, in a state which is irreversible that means we are going towards this disaster and the back arrow is probably uh, not possible unless we take serious dramatic actions immediately now why is so it, it, this is a kind of a uh, energy consumption in the world um, up from 1950 to projection up to 2050 as you can see let's say if we focus on 2020 uh, around this line this is around present time you can see that the most of the energy we get by burning the petroleum or the oil and the second um, is from the natural gas and one of the large portion is coming from burning the coal these all produce significant amount of um, 
amount of uh, greenhouse gas, basically carbon dioxide, because these are all carbon-based fuel. So the amount of carbon dioxide comes out. You can see this, the energy we are talking about at this time is more than um, 100, more than 10,000 million tons of, of equivalent petroleum. Compared to 1950, this is almost like several fold, like se at least an order of magnitude more uh, of, of fuel burning we are doing it. What's, what is the result of it by burning this much fuel? So this is the carbon emission uh, with different, at, with respect to you know, 19, sorry, 1800 to 2006 here. I didn't get a data up to uh, like 2020 yet, but I'm sure th that exists somewhere. Now, this y-axis, this is metric ton of carbon per year in billions. So this is billion metric tons. This is 1 billion. This is 10 billion. Uh, already in 2006, we reached total 10 billion metric ton of carbon emission due to our um, fuel need, due to our energy need. Just to give you an idea, the, a metric ton of carbon, what does it mean, a kind, a kind of a physical idea, is if I have a cube like this, regular data side would say 27 feet, so it's a cubic box with 27 feet. A typical human height can be compared with here. If I fill this box with carbon dioxide at ambient pressure, that means the regular atmospheric pressure on Earth, then this box, this large box, will have approximately one metric ton of carbon dioxide. We are talking about 10 billions of this box. It is 20, 2006. 2020, if we project it, it will be more than 100 billion bucks. So we are producing this amount of, of uh, carbon dioxide every year. If you stack this box, I once calculated, if I stack, stack this box uh, one top of another and I spread it across whole United States. In the United States, it's a pretty big country. One side from east to west, it is all more than 3,000 miles, like more than um, 5,000 kilometers. If I stack whole this box to, to hold the United States, the total height that we'll have from sea level to up, almost 17 to 18 miles of carbon dioxide. We are already created a disaster uh, with this carbon dioxide. And this is, you know, now not only United States, all the countries are producing this kind of carbon dioxide. What I'm trying to say is the present status of, of, the, of the greenhouse gas in, in atmosphere is pretty bad. So we need to do something. And this is one of the way, uh, some of the way of, of mitigating these effects by using more of these sources. These are all renewable and sustainable source. They should not, or they don't create um, those greenhouse gases. My personal interest is on the solar energies. Now, how do we do solar energy? Or how do we utilize solar energy? I have already showed you in the first or the second slide. Now, let me go a little more detail. What happens in here? Let's say there is sun energy coming to a box, a black box, for example. Uh, this is not definitely up to the scale. Uh, sun is far away and it is much bigger. It is just for demonstration. Light comes in the box. This box, it is a, consider it as a black box. This will convert this light into either fuel, as we mentioned, hydrogen fuel, or it will convert it into electricity in the photovoltaic cell. The, the, all these materials, either if I go for the fuel, this material is called photocatalyst. This photocatalyst is a semiconductor. Similarly, in photovoltaic cell, it needs a n-type and p-type uh, materials to make a kind of a diode type of formation. Those also need semiconductors. Whenever we are talking about light absorption and 
utilizing that light to do something else. We always talk about semiconductors. Now, most of you probably know what is semiconductors, but I will give you, you a little more technical definition of semiconductor. Now, what is the important thing from this slide? Is that to absorb light, we need a very uh, efficient light absorber, which is a kind of some kind of semiconductors. And this is the most important thing. Now, to optimize the light absorption, we first need to see what energy of light mainly coming from the sun. For that, we can look at the spectra, solar spectra. Outer line, bided A line, is the solar spectrum just above the Earth's atmosphere. With the atmospheric bide, the solar spectrum is a black line, outside black line. The inner lines or inner structures of this spectrum, when light comes through the Earth's atmosphere, some of the light gets absorbed and re emitted within the Earth's atmosphere. And then this is what we get finally at the sea level or the surface of the Earth. It is interesting to see that most of the light or most of the solar energy is coming in the visible range. This is the UV ultraviolet range, red light lighted pore, or red colored pore. These are all infrareds, higher wavelength energies. But the highest intensity of this energy, the highest energy comes from sun is within the visible range. And among the visible range, you can see green is one of the most prominent color. That's now you probably understand why most of the trees are green, because they try to make their energy absorption efficient by absorbing this green color. For our purpose, we need to absorb light at least from some level of the red color, because if we can absorb somewhere around less than 500 nanometer, let's say somewhere around the red color, then it should be able to absorb in principle anything above all of this. So we will then have all the higher uh, intensity of solar light, including the UV light. So we need to get a materials which then can absorb especially this visible light. And that relates to the band gap of a semiconductor. We will define the band gap as well in more uh, precise manner. So the main challenge for efficient light absorption, properly absorbing, uh, to properly absorb the light, we need some kind of semiconductor with some tuned properties. Now, what are these tuned properties? So to go into the details, let's first see the structure of matter. Uh, what is inside any materials? And it is shown here at different length scale from centimeter scale to very, very small scale at the quark level. And as you can see, the, all the material, they are made of atoms and molecules, sorry, some kind of molecules, the next step. And then for elemental solids, of course, there is atom, or even in the molecules, each of these are atoms. This is kind of a cartoonistic picture of atoms. Every atom has a nucleus, and the nucleus have protons and neutrons. Each of the proton and neutron will even have internal structure. We call they have quarks, and each of these quarks can be studied separately. And of course, these electrons, they are also at a very, very small dimension, uh, smaller than these hadrons, the, the neutron and protons. These are leptons. Electron is a lepton. This is like just a point particle with no internal structure. So these are these, these few blocks where we are considering the fundamental particles. These are at a very, very small scale. A small scale, excess color journal, we need very high energy. Um, this is the reason why this, this subject is called high energy physics. Now, for our purpose, most of the time we deal with materials and the electrons and the atomic features. So uh, we don't deal with high energy physics in condensed matter physics, but more, the knowledge from all these things is necessary to understand uh, whatever we do in, in condensed matter physics. The next one, the next. Um, 
question is if these are the structure of materials with atoms how then light is absorbed to explain it simply we first will start with atoms again this is a cartoonistic view of atoms nucleus and electrons going around in different orbit in 3d orbit not 2d orbit because you see that they are um, um, at some angle these orbits um, usually in a Bohr's model it shows solar system like 2d orbitals in practice atomic orbitals is 3d but this is a cartoonistic view not exactly a realistic view the concept of atom is not very new almost uh, 2500 years ago uh, democritus he proposed at the time of course uh, a philosophical proposition at the time that every material has um, some unique smallest building blocks and according to the to to democritus he named them as atoms in of course in greece in greek language uh, but the modern history of atoms can be traced in this timeline which i'm not going to describe although most of you already know um, but one thing uh, is important sometimes that th this sometimes you draw this kind of figure to describe atom uh, but nowadays, with good instrumentation, we can take photograph of atom. Uh, this is just an old example published in 2013 in Physical Review Letters. This is a kind of a photograph of a so-called real hydrogen atom. Um, the spherical nature of hydrogen S orbital is clearly seen in here. Um, the, the, as you can understand, this is not a big, you know, the, the dimension of this, of this atom is not very big. It's just for representation purpose. It is amplified to, to show the view of a full atom. You can go to this paper and find the whole article to see how they uh, take the photograph. Now, once we have the atoms and once we have the orbitals, these orbitals are in hydrogen S, this is S orbital. Then you will have 2p orbital, of course, two, sorry, 2s orbital. 2s orbitals is not occupied. But once we have this understanding of atoms and orbitals, then we can talk about light absorption. This is the evolution of atomic model from Dalton to Thomson to Rutherford. This is the cartoonistic model. And the, then the Bohr model where it is mostly like a solar system kind of model with each of the energy levels are well defined and then we get a full quantum mechanical model uh, which is very blurred in here where we know the exact shape of different orbitals like if you, you know probably that atoms has s orbital p orbital d orbital each one of them we can calculate and find the shape of them so that's the full quantum mechanical picture of atoms um, to describe the light absorption, let's talk with the Bohr model because this was used around 1914 or 15 in that time to describe light absorption for atomic spectra. To assist that explanation or to make this model possible, um, one phenomenon needs to be mentioned. Uh, which is also relevant for light absorption from solar light uh, is the photoelectric effect in photoelectric effect what happens that if you shine light on a metal surface electron emission takes place um, an interesting fact is this light rays if you just increase the intensity of the light without increasing the energy of the light these electrons don't increase their kinetic energy. They have same kinetic energy in, in, in spite of the fact that the light in intensity is increasing. However, if the light comes with higher energy, then we see that electron ejected with higher kinetic energy. To explain this phenomena, um, Albert Einstein, around 2005, used the concept uh, proposed by Max Planck that light comes in a packet and the energy of the light depends on the frequency 
of this electromagnetic wave. So this packet is called photon. And this photon, when it strikes an electron, then the electron get ejected or emitted from the surface with this same kinetic energy as the photon came with. Photon came with. Now, so this is one of the verification of the particle nature of light. Um, if, if you know that Einstein get Nobel Prize because of this work, not on his um, relativity work, uh, even though those are um, highly important work, impacted the modern physics heavily, um, despite the fact the Nobel Prize was given to him for, for the photoelectric effect. Now, let's see what happens in here in, at the atomic level. So this is the Bohr model. The nucleus is this green one, where I put my red laser. Uh, and these are the orbital, as uh, Bohr explained. Each of these orbital has well-defined energy. And as you go up from the nucleus, this is the higher energy orbital. This is the next higher energy orbital. If photon comes, a packet of light comes, it can be absorbed by an electron at a lower orbital and then get excited to the higher orbital. And the electron will only get excited when the energy of, of the photon will be equal to the energy difference of these two orbitals. Similarly, if an electron was at the higher orbital, the outer orbital, and it de-excited to a lower orbital, it will emit, emit a photon and the energy of the photon will be exactly equal to the energy difference between these two orbitals. Using this concept, now we can redefine or redraw this thing in a simplified way. Light get absorbed and then electron is start de-exciting. Um, depending from where the electron is de-excited, a photon will be emitted and the energy of the photon can relate to any of this color depending on the energy differences. These are the energy of, of different colors in nanometers. This is the basic principle, how light get absorbed in atoms and how light get emitted from atoms. Um, now we can extend this simplified picture into solid where many atoms come together to make a crystal. That's what we are going to show now, again, in a very cartoonistic way. If we have one atom, let's say sodium atom, we know that sodium atom has one um, valence electron, and that is an S electron, S orbital electron. S orbitals are usually spherical, hence we can represent it by a circle. What happens if I bring two sodium atoms? Then these orbitals overlap from both two atoms, and they create kind of an envelope around those two atoms. Um, this simplified picture or cartoonistic picture can be applied to many atoms. Here it is shown for three atoms. Um, so if you bring more atoms to the left and right up to infinity, all these atoms, all these orbitals, sorry, will uh, make a continuous energy <coughs> level. And these energy levels, when it comes to crystal, we call it bands rather than energy levels. A realistic band picture will look like this. So this is a band structure for silicon, very well-known silicon. Um, each of these lines are these bands, as we say, can be formed from aggregation of atoms. Um, and then we define band gap within a band structure. To see this in a clear way, let's go to the next slide. So in the band picture, um, we can divide the bands into two groups. One is a valence band where all the levels are occupied by electrons. Then there is a gap. And then we have some unoccupied energy levels. If you remember the atomic pictures, we do need a gap for electron excitation or de-excitation. And in a regular, in a simplified semiconductor, we can always define a band gap this gap between occupied and unoccupied energy levels. And this smallest gap between occupied and unoccupied level is called the band gap of the semiconductors. Now, for example, 
um, this is another example from iron oxide, Fe2O3. Fe2O3, you have seen uh, it everywhere. If you see iron, um, the rust on the iron, the red color uh, rust, uh, the, the rust jeta pore, red color, this is what the iron oxide, Fe2O3. Um, that iron oxide has a band structure like this. This is the band structure. Now, again, by definition of valence band and the conduction band, we can uh, classify those in the bands. For example, this group, the shaded blue, is the valence band, and that group is the conduction band. And the band gap then will be from the highest point of the conduct valence band, the occupied band, to the lowest point of the conduction band. We could call it like VBA, VBM, valence band maximum, and conduction band minimum in here. And this red transition will define the band gap. One more quantity that sometimes we mention to, to describe the highest occupied level is the Fermi energy in, in semiconductor, which is defined as the top of the valence band. Now, uh, to have the proper light absorption or to use these materials for any of those uh, solar light conversion devices, photovoltaic or, or photoelectrolysis or photoelectrochemical cell, usually if I just take one material from nature, like silicon or iron oxide, there are other oxide like zinc oxide, tungsten oxide, titanium dioxide, um, those materials are not by themselves are efficient enough to be used for those devices. We try to modify those materials, modify their electronic properties, not modifying by um, changing it in different shape or mixing it with something else arbitrarily. Rather, we look at these energy levels. That means these, where electrons can occupy and how they can excite. Uh, even though this is the minimum gap, we said sometimes we see that if we want to excite light from valence band to the conduction band, this minimum gap is not an allowed transition gap because of some, um, some symmetry principles. We need to define, we need to modify, we need to change materials. That is the common scenario uh, to get a very efficient light absorbing materials. Now, how do we do this? How do we calculate everything? Because as I mentioned that my uh, re group's research is on theoretical and computational uh, condensed matter physics. Hence, we need to calculate everything. We need to calculate those band structure the light absorption, the light absorption probability. To do that, uh, of course, these are all quantum mechanical method, and these are many body method. Many body method means, um, if we think of, of, of a material, um, let's say even sodium, where you have one valence electron, however, in one mole of sodium, you have 10 to the power 23 atoms, hence 10 to the power 23 electrons. These are huge number of electrons to, to handle with. Um, if you have seen classical mechanics or quantum mechanics, we know that um, we can solve exactly for two body problem. If it is three body problem, like three system or three electrons or three gravitational object, um, the exact solution is not possible. There has to be some numerical uh, um, approximations. If you go like uh, 10 to the power 23, a few hundred billion atoms, uh, then it becomes almost impossible to solve. Hence, there are some quantum mechanical methods available to tackle those kind of problems, which definitely reduce some level of accuracy, but is good enough to do things. Two main branch of the method that is usually used, one is wave function based method, uh, started with some Hartree-Fock method. And the second is uh, density functional theory method, which depends on the ground state electron density. The difference between these two approach is that in the wave function method, 
you have three n degrees of freedom, n being the number of particle uh, we are considering. For density functional method, as it is density, electron density, that is the important quantity, electron density is just a scalar number, and it has maximum three degrees of freedom based on this position vector r. So in our you know, research, we mostly uh, confine ourselves with this type of method, density functional theory. This is one of the state of the art method, hence, um, and also computationally and accuracy, accuracy wise, um, is better than Hardy Fock method. Of course, Hardy Fock method has its own uh, benefits when we need them. So, the density functional method, as we mentioned, um, that the main quantity that it needs is, is the de electron density. So, we define a functional of electron density. Now, I need to specify it is not a function of density. It is functional. There is a slight uh, mathematical definition, uh, difference between function and functional. Whenever we talk about functional, we use a square bracket, as you can see here. When you talk about function, these are regular parentheses. Um, I, for the time being, I'm not going into the detail of definition function versus functional. All we need to know for the time being is that uh, this is the method we use uh, proposed by the theorem proposed by Hohenberg and Kohn. And then Kohn and his postdoc, they make the method implementable to do calculation and computations. For this contribution, Walter Kohn received Nobel Prize in 1998. As you can see, he is receiving his medal from the King of Sweden. Now, what is density functional theory? In short, um, because it's a mathematical theory, I will not go into the detail of the mathematics. It is a first principle method, meaning, again, uh, all we need is the, is the atoms. What kind of atoms we are dealing with? If it is iron oxide, we need iron and oxygen, and in a crystal, where they reside, what kind of crystal they make. If we have this information, then this is all we need to do all the calculation, all the property prediction. We don't need any experimental parameters to fix the, the result. So this is why it is a first principle method, and it is one of the most popular and state-of-the-art method for electronic structure calculations. Um, it has a rigorous mathematical foundations and some shortcomings, like one of the universal functional is not known in its exact form. So we need to make some approximation in here. Uh, other than that, this is a very valid or um, extensive method to work with. Uh, one of the shortcomings for not knowing the exact universal functional is that the band gap prediction sometimes is not very accurate. Now, to do this kind of work, it's a heavy computational you know, work. Um, so we need to use supercomputers. Unfortunately, in Texas, we have this advanced computing center, which is ranked nowadays in the top 10 supercomputers in the, in the world at this time, one of the top 10. Uh, hence, we have a pretty good uh, computational facilities in, in University of Texas. Now, how to improve light absorptions? Um, first, we can tune the band gap because band gap is one of the feature that needs to be tuned to absorb the light. Now, to make sure that at the band gap, the minimum gap between occupied and unoccupied electrons, the electron excitation is allowed because from a transition matrix, from uh, quantum mechanical transition matrix calculation, we call dipole matrix. Um, it usually forbid from simple matrix element calculation. We can show that it usually forbid S to S orbital transition, P to P orbital transition, D to D orbital transition. So this S, S, P, P, D, D transitions are forbidden. Hence, uh, usually when it goes from S to P, like one orbital number higher, or from P to D, those are more favorable transition. We need to make sure that to, do, to tune the gap, and again, to have bands or energy levels such that they have proper orbital mixing. And then, of course, once the electron gets excited, 
we need good electron mobility to have current in the materials. And, and sometimes there are materials, we have seen that when light comes absorbed in the materials, especially the higher end of the energy, like violet, ultraviolet, they can dislodge atoms in the material. And hence, the material quality degrade. So we need a pretty stable material. And for practical purposes, it is to make the material cost lower. If the elements of the materials are earth abundant, it is better. And also, we need a good synthesis protocol so that it can be synthesized in a large scale for their utilization. To tune band gap, there are several strategies. Um, let's have just quick description or just naming. I will not describe it. It will take too long time now. Um, the first is by doping. What is by doping? Doping is, let's say we take a material, gallium nitride. Um, this is one of the material that produced a green laser. The green laser pointer most likely will have gallium nitride. It has a very high band gap. We can modify the band gap and the band properties, let's say, by um, doping aluminum in there. So if you dope aluminum in gallium nitride, the band gap gets reduced. This is one way of doing it. Another way, in the same gallium nitride, uh, we can dope zinc and nitrogen together. In the gallium place, we can put some zinc. In the nitrogen place, we can give some oxygen. Now, this is called sometimes a passive co-doping. That means the valence structure or the valence electron uh, will not change. The total valence electron in gallium nitride will be same as this zinc oxide doping. Uh, sometimes for some crystalline synthesis purpose, um, these kind of dopings are preferable. The third approach by predicting novel alloys, meaning you have gallium nitride by itself. These two will still preserve gallium nitride crystal structure, but this may not be enough to modify the gap or modify the materials for light absorption and for photovoltaic or photoelectrochemical purpose. In that case, we may need to go to predict new alloys. That means when we put different elements in there, the crystal structure will completely change, and it will give a new type of material. Um, this is challenging. This is not very easy, because as I mentioned in DFT, the information it needs is the types of atoms, elements, and the crystal structure, where the atom sits, those positions. If I have a completely new alloy, I don't know the crystal structure in that case. Hence, the first challenge was to predict the crystal structure. Predicting crystal structure from first principle is still one of the most challenging tasks to do. And the fourth one is by reducing the dimension. That means working with nanomaterials at cluster or molecular levels. And that is also done routinely. We have done computation on the fourth aspect as well. But in today's talk, I am not going to touch this fourth uh, aspect. I will try to briefly show the doping and alloying uh, work. Now, how doping modify a band gap? So this cartoon that I'm going to show here is mainly applicable for metal oxide. That means you have metal and oxygen, like iron oxide or zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. Those kind of oxide um, are, you know, are very stable materials, but they have usually higher band gap. This particular cartoon is based on those oxide materials. So if I have valence band for those kind of oxide, this valence band will have mostly oxygen p orbital at the top. Now if we can put some orbital, for example, by doping, these are impurity that can sit on top of this oxygen band, then effectively we reduce the gap. Um, if we need to reduce the gap to get red light or green light absorption, this could be one of a, a good strategy. So this, for impurity P-band, we need to work on the oxygen side. Most likely, an oxygen needs to be replaced by a nitrogen atom that can give this kind of effect. Another way to decrease the gap um, is that to, to work on the metal side. That means in metal, most likely these metal oxides are uh, transition metal oxides. 
In that case, we can work with the D band or the D orbital of the metal atoms. If we place the D band, if we replace a metal atom by another uh, properly selected metal atom, then the D band can sit somewhere in the valence band. But then by uh, creating bonding, when it will try to create bond with the crystal, it will create bonding, anti-bonding splitting. Hence, it can push the valence band up, then make the gap smaller, closer to one of the desired color, for example. So this is two major ways of doping uh, for modifying band gap to absorb light by doping. Now, this is one of the examples from our previous work. We published several papers over the time. Um, <clears throat> there are three references are given here. One of the most recent isn't listed here. Anyway, um, so this is tungsten oxide, WO3. Tungsten, this is crystal structure of tungsten oxide. Blue atoms are tungsten metal. The red ones are oxygen. Uh, this, if you know uh, the name, this looks like a, almost a perovskite, but a distorted perovskite materials with uh, one of the metal atoms missing in the center. This is structure from this tungsten oxide, we calculated its band structure. So this is the band structure, as you can see. Now, anything below zeros are occupied. We call them valence band. Anything above from this line, these are the conduction band, unoccupied. Hence, if light comes, there's a solar light comes, um, electron will be excited from the valence band to the conduction band. Now, this plot on the right side, this is the optical absorption coefficients, or you can consider it or think of it as a um, absorption probability or electron excitation probability from the valence band to the conduction band. Um, as you can see that the conduction, the electron absorption probability or the absorption coefficient uh, doesn't increase much before somewhere like 2.3 or 2.4 electron volt. That means we are blocking all the uh, the red light and some part of the green light as well. Where we want most solar light absorption is around this region. And around this region, the absorption probability is very low. That means with this gap, with this natural gap, it cannot be used efficiently for solar light absorption and hence either photovoltaic or photoelectrolysis materials. Um, we need to change this feature. We need to enhance the absorption around this region. So for that, let's work with the doping. And this is just a color scheme to show you um, that this is around 2.4. That means 2.4 is somewhere here, electron volt. It is blocking all the light from the red to up to 2.4. It can only absorb some of these lights uh, but the intensity of these lights is lower than this light, since the optical absorption from solar light will be very poor in tungsten oxide. To improve it, we let's say try some doping. We did co-doping, which is N and H, nitrogen with hydrogen. The purpose of putting hydrogen in here is that then the valence of tungsten oxide, if we put nitrogen at the oxygen place, and attach a hydrogen with it, with it, then the total valence electron remains same. In that particular case, usually uh, the, the crystallinity of the material doesn't uh, deteriorate much. Now, if we do that thing, this is the optical absorption, and this is the tungsten oxide without doping. Now, you can see that around two electron volt, uh, the absorption probability increases slightly, not much. It's, it's very slight, small, uh, enhancement but it did enhance it is not good enough for let's say a robust practical applications so we need now to uh, to find a different methodology to increase this light absorption in tungsten oxide now we will go for the alloying approach as we mentioned this is more challenging but it may help what is the difference between doping and alloying? In doping, um, the overall crystal structure remains the same. It doesn't change much. Um, usually, it shouldn't if it is doping. 
Uh, but with, um, let's say, arbitrary doping, not being careful enough, the crystallinity or the crystal properties of, of that materials can be harmed. We have to be careful. Then alloying, let's say we are doing, uh, we are taking tungsten oxide and alloy something to improve its, enhance its properties. Usually a new crystal structure emerges. And even the stoichiometric relation, that means this molecular formula like WO3, that one tungsten, three oxygen, this molecular formula can also change. Hence, this is, um, more involved work to do. I will give you a quick glimpse for glimpse of what we have done on this thing. So we are now predicting a new alloy based on tungsten oxide. The first step is to identify what to alloy with tungsten oxide so that it can do whatever we need. Uh, that needs a lot of reading and testing. Um, I just put it in a parenthesis. It, it may take um, six months to even a year just to get the right thing to alloy. Um, so for our purpose, we need to enhance the optical properties and the goal is to reduce the gap, the gap of tungsten oxide. We have seen at around 2.3, 2.4, the absorption is not happening. So we want to reduce that gap at less than two if possible. Um, and also, uh, the atoms that will go to, for alloying in tungsten oxide, they have to compatible with the desired optical positions. That means it should not forbid the transition, those SSPP or DD transition. After we, you know, do after we did testing, then we decide that bismuth and copper can be put in tungsten oxide and make a new alloy. Now, why bismuth and copper? Th these are very few simplified reason because we have found bismuth tungsten, the valence band up uplift takes place because of hybridization of oxygen 2p and bismuth 6s electrons. This or, or hybridization has a name, it's a bonding, anti-bonding, and this s are called lone pair electrons. Uh, the lone pair electrons has some special properties. Uh, you can search the, word in, search the word in Google. And then why copper? Because we found in copper tungsten, the hybridization or coupling of oxygen 2p and copper 3d that also make a favorable conduction band uplift and increase the PD transition, which are favorable transition. Hence, you can see in both of the cases, either we put bismuth and copper, oxygen 2P plays an important role. How we defined or how we determine for bismuth and copper. So instead of doping copper and bismuth, we search for a new structure that can accommodate in tungsten. धन्यवाद
প্রিয় শিক্ষার্থী বন্ধু তো আমরা খুবই দুঃখিত আমরা অনেক চেষ্টা করলাম আমাদের ক্রিকেটে আমাদের সংযোগ স্থাপনে আমরা ব্যর্থ হয়েছি আমাদের প্রিয় সাথে পুরো সংযোগ স্থাপনে তো সকলকে ধন্যবাদ আমাদের সাথে সব সময় থাকার জন্য এবং আমাদেরকে সহযোগ করার জন্য সকলে ভালো থাকবেন সুস্থ থাকবেন এবং স্বাস্থ্যবিধি মেনে থাকবেন এবং নিজের এবং নিজের পরিবারকে কোভিড থেকে মুক্ত রাখবেন সৌরাত